we shall start now uh good evening one and all i'm apurva state coordinator ima ms in tamil nadu i take immense pleasure in welcome you all to med infinite 2020 med infinite 2020 is an online medical conference conducted by the ima ms in and jd in tamil nadu for the medical students all over the country it started from july 16 and it will go on till september 15 It's the third day of the conference and it's been going really well. Thank you everyone for supporting and participating. So now we have the session on the topic of the heart on the very important and much needed topic prevent preventing the transmission of covid in healthcare providers. To talk to us about such an important topic we have on board two eminent and great speakers. I take utmost privilege in welcoming Dr. Val and dr daniel vander on thank you so much sir for accepting our invite to share your wisdom and enlightening us before before i introduce you to the speakers i would like you like to thank our sponsors iris need pg a great online platform for pre pg preparation you can check out their content their website for some amazing content and apipola a mobile accessories and electronics company Let us now begin the session without any further ado. I would like to start it off with a small introduction uh, of our speakers for the day, Dr. Valen and Dr. Daniel Andre. Dr. A. S. Valen is a public health specialist of infectious diseases for the Division of Global Health Protection Centers for Disease Control and Prevention (CDC), India Country Office, New Delhi. He supports infectious disease surveillance with focus on activities improving prevention, detection, and response to antimicrobial resistance and survival surveillance of healthcare associated infections in India. Dr. Valen is a medical doctor with wide range of technical and preventive health program public health program management experience in communicable and non-communicable diseases. He has previous, previously worked with the National AIDS Control Organization (NACO). International Training and Education Center for Health (ITEC). He has also worked as a trainee India Epidemic Intelligence Service Officer, National Center for Disease Control (India) at National Institute of Research in Tuberculosis, Indian Indian Council of Medical Research, and National Program for Cancer Diabetes, Cardiovascular Diseases, and Stroke at MOHFW New New Delhi. He has also worked as technical consultant for WHO India Country Office. and WHO CEO offices in Bhutan and, and India Dr Valen has many national and international scientific publications to his credit and has also co-authored chapter on healthcare assisted infections in the national guidelines for infection prevention and control in healthcare facilities ministry of health and family welfare Dr Valen is a life member of Indian Medical Association and the Indian Red Cross Society I take a great privilege in welcoming you sir Thank you, Apurva. Uh, for our second speaker, we have Dr. Daniel Van der On. Daniel, Dr. Daniel Van der On is a medical officer, International Infection Control Program, Office of the Director, Division of Healthcare Quality Promotion, CDC. Dr. Van der On received his bachelor's degree at Wetton College, Wetton, Illinois, and his MD at Case Western Reserve University, Cleveland, Ohio. He completed his clinical residency in internal medicine at the Vanderbilt University, Nashville, Tennessee, and his MPH from Rollins School of Public Health, Atlanta, Georgia. He also completed a public policy fellowship at the Satcher Health Leadership Institute and in Morehouse School of Medicine. Dr. Vanderhand uh, has practiced medicine and directed quality improvement initiatives in domestic and international healthcare facilities. Prior to joining CDC in 2015. He directed communicable disease programs at, as the medical program administrator for the Fulton County Department of Health and Wellness. Starting in 2015, he has served as a medical officer for the International Infection Control Program, supporting efforts in Africa, Asia, the Caribbean, and the Middle East to build sustainable capacity to prevent, detect, and respond to healthcare-associated infections globally. These efforts have included the provision of technical assistance. to develop policy guidelines and programs to improve surveillance systems infection prevention and control antimicrobial stewardship at the national state and facility levels since 
Dr. Van der Arndt has worked to support efforts to build sustainable capacity to prevent, detect, and respond to healthcare-associated infections in India. He also has many scientific and international publications to his credit, and he is a principal investigator on multiple research projects seeking to add new knowledge to the field. I take a great, immense, and great and immense pleasure in welcoming you, sir. Thanks, sir. Uh, so we can uh, now start the session. Uh, so uh, before beginning the session, I would like to tell that the audience, please refrain from asking questions in the middle, and you can keep your questions at the end of the session, where you, we will have a Q and A section. So we uh, over to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Apurva. Um, first of all, I would like to acknowledge uh, the support provided by my colleague, Dr. Dan Van Trende for preparation of the slides and uh, headquarters. Like the most of the slides which we are going to talk about today are from the CDC's archives uh, for the infection prevention control from our headquarters team. And uh, there was immense support from our country office and especially from Dr. Dan Van Trende for preparing these slides. So today we will be going to um, uh, discuss about uh, protecting healthcare workers from COVID-19 uh, in during this pandemic in the healthcare facilities. So for, to, un, to talk about uh, the preventive measures, we should understand the basics of epidemiology. Uh, what all are the revised symptoms uh, which has been enlisted by international agencies? How this COVID-19 transmission happens? And like, what all are the surveillance case definitions available in India and internationally for um, um, like documenting these cases and the strategies for uh, preventing infections among the outpatients in the healthcare facilities, inpatients, and healthcare workers. So, if you uh, look at the pandemic situation as on date, uh, so two, 216 countries uh, and territories are affected by this pandemic. And more than um, like 13 million like um, uh, confirmed cases we have, and we have like more than half a million uh, confirmed deaths happen. So the map here on the right side shows uh, like the situation of COVID-19 for the past seven days by countries. You can see India, United States, Brazil, and all like they are like the very much dark in color reporting uh, more than one lakh cases. If you see the Indian scenario, uh, 35 states and union territories out of 36, like they have reported cases. So more than a million confirmed cases have been reported. And uh, uh, out of those, like uh, the good thing is more than 6,77,000 has uh, been discharged or like they have been declared cured. And we have lost 26,000 people uh, 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 like due to COVID in our country as per the reports of Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. Uh, as on date, like this is uh, as per the Ministry of Health, Health and Family Welfare website uh, access today morning. So if you see Mah uh, the states, Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu and Delhi has most number of cases with Maharashtra more than 3 lakh cases, Tamil Nadu with more than 1 lakh 50,000 cases and Delhi also like more uh, about 1 lakh cases. The least uh, reported cases are from Andaman, Mizoram and Sikkim, like which has like uh, th these three have uh, less than a thousand cases um, like re reported as on date. So we should be aware of the symptoms before starting the session. Like unless we are aware of the symptoms, we won't be able to detect and like prevent our healthcare providers uh, from COVID-19. So the symptoms you all know, it can appear uh, uh, between like two to 14 days after exposure to the virus. And the median time is uh, like four to five days. So the people with these symptoms are combination of symptoms with COVID-19. The classical symptoms are fever or chill, cough, shortness of breath, or difficulty in breathing. So additional symptoms which can accompany this are like which can like without this classical symptom also you may just have a fatigue, muscle or body ache, headache, new loss of taste or smell, sore throat, congestion or runny nose, nausea or vomiting, and diarrhea. So this is as per the latest uh, Centers for Disease Control guidance, and uh, this has been adopted by uh, like many international bodies also. 
So India has also revised uh, the um, uh, guidelines based on the latest symptoms prescribed by Centers for Disease Control. So um, how COVID-19 gets transmitted? So the spread pe people in like the, uh, it is currently believed based on the evidence that uh, it can happen through direct, indirect or close contact with infected people via mouth or nose secretion. So this includes saliva, respiratory secretion or secretion droplets released from mouth or nose with an infected, uh, whenever an infected person coughs, sneezes, sneezes uh, speaks or sings. People who are in close contact within one meter with an infected person can catch COVID-19 when those infectious droplets get in touch, uh, like the, into the mouth or nose directly. So, or like also through indirect, you can contact through surfaces by touching, like when the droplets are there on the surfaces, you touch that and then you touch your nose or mouth or eyes, like then you can get infected. So now there are a lot of uh, talking about uh, the airborne transmission of SARS-CoV-2. So what does the World Health Organization say about uh, um, uh, the um, airborne transmission of SARS-CoV-2? And we will be hearing more from our expert, uh, Dr. Dan Van Rente regarding airborne transmission during the question and answer sessions. So the airborne transmission is defined as the spread of an infectious agent caused by dissemination of droplet nuclei that remain infectious when suspended in air over long distance and time. The airborne transmission of SARS-CoV-2 can occur during medical procedures that generate aerosols, that those are called AGPs or aerosol generating procedures. A number of respiratory droplets generate microscopic aerosol by evaporating, and normal breathing and talking can result in exhaled aerosol. A susceptible person could inhale aerosol and could become infected if the aerosol contained the virus in sufficient quantity. Again, how much is the sufficient quantity? It is still being expedited, which can cause infection within the recipient. However, as I mentioned, like uh, the uh, it's still under um, uh, study. Like, how what is the quantity required for infecting through um, uh, this aerosol procedures? So what are the current evidences regarding airborne transmission of COVID-19 as uh, mentioned in the uh, World Health Organization uh, latest infection prevention control document? The recent clinical reports of healthcare workers exposed to COVID-19 index cases not in the presence of aerosol generating procedures found. There is no nosocomial transmission when contact and droplet precautions were appropriately used, including wearing a medical mask as a component of personal protective equipment. Further studies are needed to determine whether it is possible to detect viable SARS-CoV-2 in air samples from settings where no procedures that generate aerosols are performed and the role of aerosol might, might play a transmission. So this is still under a, a study and as of date, the WHO says there might be, but currently there is no evidence. So maybe let, the evidence may evolve in the future. So what are the evidences of airborne transmission of SARS-CoV-2 in non-clinical uh, settings like has been, which has been reported as on date? So outside of medical facilities, some outbreak reports related to indoor crowded spaces suggested the possibility of aerosol transmission combined with droplet transmission. So this has happened during a choir pra practice and there are published report about this happened in a closed restaurant from people got infected in a closed restaurant where the air condition was suspected to be the source of uh, infection. So, and also a fitness center uh, where the people who attended the fitness classes, like they also got infected. So these three reports are available and the references mentioned below. These slides will be available, uh, like will be provided to you. So you can refer to the study later. And I would like to hear more from my colleague uh, during uh, the subsequent session after me. So in all these events, short range aerosol transmission, particularly in specific indoor locations such as crowded and inadequately ventilated spaces over a prolonged period of time with infected persons cannot be ruled out. So a uh, thing is like still it can, it can be uh, debated that like can it be still be a droplet uh, infection, not, a, a not due to airborne transmission. So now coming to the healthcare facilities, uh, what PPE should be used in healthcare facilities? So many people have asked this question uh, when Apurva shared uh, the questionnaire with, uh, with us. So the personal protective equipments must be rationally used for activities commonly performed by healthcare workers. The use of PPE should be based on the transmission-based precautions 
and like pp is not recommended for like each and everything so based on like what is the risk involved those pp's has to be selected like appropriately healthcare workers involved in direct care, care of covid 19 patients should wear appropriate pp they should wear gloves non sterile examination gloves are enough so medical mask so that is a triple layer mask eye protection goggles or face shields because like splashes should not happen to the eye and like again through conjunctiva you can get infection so eye protection is the must and gown or long sleeve non sterile uh, uh, the gowns can be used so this uh, the, the picture shown here is based on the um, who recommended pp for managing covid 19 so now they, you can you can ask like uh, if you don't recommend uh, n95 mask like uh, other than uh, uh, like where there is an aerosol generation like for common uh, patient care and things like that so seeing the patient in opd medical mask is enough like when uh, like what are the are the procedures which generate aerosol like where people should be opting for like more um, um, like um, more personal protective equipments like respirators and all so for that we should understand like what all are the examples of some aerosol generating procedures which can happen in a healthcare facility aerosols can be generated by medical procedures in uh, and it can be route of transmission for covid-19 virus so uh, and these aerosols can be potentially infected like if it is from a covid-19 patient it can be potentially infectious so uh, you have to be careful like uh, any intubating procedure or extubation or related procedures can generate lot of aerosols tracheostomy or tracheostomy procedures can generate uh, aerosols manual ventilation so when you are uh, ventilating a patient using a ambu bag or something like it can again cause uh, aerosol generation within the space or uh, in and around the patient open suctioning bronchoscopy surgery and post mortem procedures in which high speed devices are are used like for example when you are using automated uh, your electro electric saw or something or you are splashing the liquid or something it can generate lot of aerosols so this can occur both in surgical procedures or also when you are pro providing like medical legal autopsy and when you are uh, dissecting so when you are using these type of equipment you have to use it cautiously or you have to uh use it with the uh, protection with the vacuum su suctioning unit and all so uh, other procedures which can generate uh, aerosol involve non invasive ventilation by by uh, the, for example bipap high frequency oscillating ventilations high flow nasal oxygen also can generate because like you are passing the oxygen through a humidifier like which can generate lot of uh, aerosols so and uh, when you are inducing a sputum like for example you all know that like uh, for diagnosis of tb and you know, all like induced sputum is one of the method in uh, pediatric population so when you are inducing a sputum for a di for some diagnostic procedures like it can generate lot of aerosols and if the patient was uh, having the virus he can spread to others dental procedures again like uh, where they use high speed drilling and they will be pump like uh, flushing the water and all so it can generate lot of aerosols and uh, the healthcare provider or the person who is assisting the healthcare provider can get infected if the uh, patient who is undergoing procedure had the infection so certain other procedures equipments may generate an aerosol from material other than patient secretions but are not considered to represent a significant infectious risk procedure in this category include administration of pressurized humidified oxygen administration of medication via nebulization but you have to be careful when you are nebulizing uh, the patient so what should we do for aerosol generating procedures aerosol generating procedures uh, induced coughing should be performed cautiously and avoided if possible if performed the following should occur the healthcare provider in the room should wear an n95 or a high level respirator high protection gloves and gown so masks are considered highly contaminated post procedure and should be discarded immediately the number of healthcare providers present during the procedure should be limited to only those who are essential for the patient care and supportive for the uh, procedure support and visitors should not be present in the procedure and aerosol generating procedure should ideally take place in a Uh, airborne infection isolation room if available and clean and disinfect procedure room surfaces immediately after the procedure so that from the fomite uh, you you won't be getting transmitted with covid
So uh, for any aerosol generating procedures, it requires additional personal protective equipment as uh, I had mentioned earlier. So uh, you, the, uh, you should perform the aerosol generating procedure in an adequated ventilated room, uh, which has at least 12 air exchanges per hour. And uh, uh, you should be wearing appropriate PPE. So you should be using particulate respirator not less than N95 or FFP2 as per the European standard or FFP3, which provides at least 94% protection against uh, uh, this uh, respiratory virus. So uh, you have to be really, really very careful like while you don and doff the um, uh, personal protective equipments. So this is very, very important because like most of the time healthcare providers get infected while they are doffing. So you have to follow the steps like there are very clear procedures and videos available from Centers for Disease Control and from WHO. So you can watch those videos and the, you have to follow the appropriate se sequence so that wearing PPE is fine, but unless you doff it with all uh, following the necessary steps, like you may get infected, the chances of infection, because your whole PPE is contaminated with uh, a lot of body fluids and infectious material. So doffing is very, very important and you have to follow the uh, correct steps. How to prevent transmission of SARS-CoV-2 in healthcare facilities? So for what patient can do is like they can use telemedicine facility to inform healthcare providers if they are seeking care for respiratory uh, symptoms. So they should wear a face cover or a face mask if uh, necessarily, and they should notify the registration desk about like what symptoms they are having, whether they are respiratory symptomatic or like they are having some other symptoms. They should be washing hands at healthcare facility entrance and touching the surfaces, uh, like and do not not to touch the surfaces unnecessarily. And they should carry a tissue or other alternative to cover the mouse, like if face covers are not available and they, sh they should not be spitting outside. So at least one meter, like again, it is being debated, like one meter or two meters. So minimum one meter uh, distance should be uh, maintained between like uh, any, at all times, like either whether it is a registration desk person or uh, another person, uh, patient who's coming uh, to the healthcare facility so one meter minimum distance should be maintained so if it is uh, more than one or like more than uh, one meter or like two meters like it is well and good the more distance you maintain the chances of infections uh, are uh, getting the infection is very less because like you know very well like as we had seen like even loud speaking and um, uh, like singing and all like loud speaking can generate a lot of droplets and you, you can splash it outside and um, like we, when we hear from Dan, like we will be hearing more about that. So how to manage ill patients seeking care? Use clinical triage in all healthcare facilities for early identification of patients with acute respiratory infection to prevent transmission of pathogens to healthcare workers and others. So uh, first, uh, like if you want to do triage, you should know like what all are the case definitions which has been given by WHO and which has currently adopted by Ministry of Health and Family Welfare also. So we have the same definition. Like WHO and Ministry of Health has the same health definition for a suspected case, probable case, and a confirmed case. A suspected case, you know very well uh, that if any patient with acute respiratory illness, a fever, or at least one sign or symptom of respiratory disease, exam like shortness of breath or cough, and a history of travel to a residence in location reporting community transmission of COVID-19 during the last 14 days prior to the symptom, or a patient with uh, acute respiratory illness and having been in contact with the confirmed or a probable case, or a patient with uh, acute respiratory illness who, uh, who is requiring care and you cannot establish other diagnosis. So these are the definitions for the suspected case, and the, these has to be followed like at all times, like in every healthcare facility when you are doing triage of a patient. So in the outpatient de department, you have to do uh, triaging of uh, any patient entering into a healthcare facility. So you should ensure like everyone wearing face mask or a face cover. So if, it, if they are not uh, having like the, there should be, uh, they should be, it should be made available at the registration desk. And there should be, if you see here, uh, in the first picture, so the person uh, in the registration desk and uh, uh, the patient, like both are having at least one meter distance. So in the, in the initial phase, and there can be physical barriers also like between 
the registration desk uh, person and the patient like it can be using a glass uh, she, uh, uh, or using a plastic uh, like a sheet like ma makeshift arrangements can be made but if the barrier is there again this will limit your ppe use and also it will protect the healthcare worker who is at the registration desk from contracting the infection like if at all the patient was possible, like uh, having the disease you know so then uh, after that like uh, the, if you see like um, uh, there should be appropriate um, um, uh, wastage bins for collecting the disposal of like mask and like tissue paper all those things and uh, there should be place for washing the hands or alcoholic rub should be provided near the registration desk so again like if you enter like if anyone who is symptomatic they will be immediately separated and they will be made, told to wait in the room like that is respiratory symptomatics even the non symptomatics they would be advocated for maintaining a distance of at least 1 meter between them and they, like they will be like uh, moved separately so in the respiratory waiting area please and if you see this picture in the uh, orange color box like uh, even while waiting even if they are symptomatic after wearing mask also you should ensure that patients are sitting, uh, sitting at 1 meter distance apart so the chair should be put like at only at one meter distance like uh, there should be a minimum one meter distance between two chairs placed in the waiting area of whether it is for respiratory or non respiratory symptomatics so identification of inpatients with suspected covid 19 cases this is very very important the objective of this process is to identify inpatients with suspected covid 19 and guide infection prevention control strategies to prevent transmission so you can adapt a passive strategy or enhanced passive strategy or active strategy. So in the passive strategy, the clinicians are kept informed of the current clinical definitions, case definitions, which has been provided uh, by the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. And clinicians must be made aware of what to do if they suspect anyone with COVID-19 in a hospitalized patient. This can happen. Like the patient may come and get admitted for surgery, but unless the surgeon knows like what all are the uh, uh, definitions, latest definitions available and what all are the latest symptoms available. Um, so then like he won't be able to pick up the case at the earliest, you know, like, so you, we all like uh, all clinicians who are managing all PGs, all junior doctors who are working, they should be aware of what all are the symptoms other than the classical symptoms. And they should be aware of the case definitions provided by the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare and WHO. So earlier there were a lot of uh, different, like, many difference between the Indian case definitions and the WHO, but now it's one and the same. The passive strategy considerations um, uh, are, and, and uh, like, so uh, I, dependent on the participation and skill of available clinicians and understanding of local epidemiology and clinical presentation of COVID-19 may differ in different populations. So one size doesn't fit for all, like, because you know very well, like some states are having more cases, some districts are having more cases. If you Take Tamil Nadu, Chennai is having a lot of cases and uh, like in, in more than 10,000, 50,000 cases are there in Chennai. So if you see other districts, it is less than 10,000. 10, so it, it based on the local, unless the clinician understands the local epidemiology and things like it won't be very effective to do, like it may vary from place to place. That's what I would like to uh, mention. So in enhanced passive strategy, uh, uh, can be done by establishing systems that prompt or require clinicians to regularly review all patients for likelihood of COVID-19. For example, incorporating consideration of COVID-19 into sign out reporting. So before anyone goes out, you should make, you can make it mandatory that like, how did you suspect anyone with COVID? And that has to be documented also. It's not only just by conveying while you are handing over the duty and going out, but you, you can create a system for documenting that. So this is an enhanced passive strategy where you ensure that is documented and the cases are identified early so that the transmission can be prevented inside the healthcare facility. In active strategy, a targeted data collection and review of patient information by groups specifically responsible and trained for identification of suspected COVID-19 cases. So these groups can be a facility in IPC committee or like a hospital infection control team so it can be a, 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 like a public health authorities like uh, who has been assigned as a team from the uh, deputy director of health services like for Tamil Nadu you have like they, they, they may assign a team in each health facility identify a team and assign a team for doing 
actively finding the cases among the non covid uh, uh, like facilities you know like there are a lot of other hospitals which may not be having covid case but like but you there are chances that some of the patients who are mildly symptomatic or like pre symptomatic they can get admitted and later they may develop symptoms or develop the disease so actively you will be identifying them in, in the non covid facilities or like it can be other local public health authorities also uh, can be included as part of this team so our healthcare workers in covid areas more at risk so if you see like a, a study proactively swabbed at rt pcr over uh, 1200 uh, nhs staff and asked about covid 19 symptoms 1000 staff members reporting fit for duty during the study period with 3% tested positive for the corona virus of those testing positive one in five reported no symptoms two in five reported mild symptoms and two in five reported covid 19 symptoms that had stopped more than a week previously again even if you are doing actively following up so the persons who are asymptomatic or if the people those who have had symptoms like two weeks back like they can still be positive so this is what we we infer from the study which was conducted in england so uh, our healthcare workers in covid 19 areas more at risk so like where like in this study like the where infections are greater among staff wearing appropriate ppe uh, uh, in red areas so these people uh, in, during the in the study they have categorized uh, the areas into three uh, three different uh, colors so uh, like uh, there are, there is a green color that is in the opd where it is less risk so then amber color and the red color so the red area staffs were three times more likely to be covid 19 positive than a green area so there are still many unanswered questions in the study if transmission occurred from patients to staff in red areas did staff get it from home did staff get it from colleague because like they all are wearing appropriate pp and they know whom they are dealing with or it is unclear if representative like this can be extrapolated to all healthcare facilities in the country or even outside the um, uh, country like uh, that is outside england the implications that hospital need to introduce screening programs across the workforce testing important uh, tool to uh, stop infection spreading within the hospital setting so how early identification of symptomatic healthcare providers can be done so the it can be done through again through passive strategy or enhanced passive strategy or through active strategy as we did for in patient care so all healthcare workers uh, self assess in the passive strategy like you will be assessing for yourself so they will be doing self assessment for fever and or a defined set of newly symptomatic uh, symptom symptoms indicative of covid 19 if the healthcare worker has a fever or respiratory symptom they should not report to the facility and remotely report their condition to the authorized or the, the coordinating person in the healthcare facility and they should be provided with immediate medical assessment and follow uh, from home so in enhanced passive strategy like apart from like uh, uh, this they can also utilize uh, Uh, reminders and prompt messages for workers like through sms messages or whatsapp message or group messages about uh, like a self assessment of their symptom and you can also make phone calls to remind the workers like uh, all the healthcare workers including nurses all other paramedicals and medic uh, the doctors can be reminded of so in active strategy uh, all healthcare workers coming to the healthcare facility you should be screened prior to each shift like uh, for like you can ask these questions and also you can do screening of temperature and things like that so you can also follow and enhance like there is a remote active strategy that all healthcare workers required to report presence or lack of symptoms remotely prior to so before coming to the healthcare facility you make it a system in your health facility that they should be reporting so i don't have fever i don't have any symptom so i am coming to work today so then they come and they will be assessed in the healthcare facility also that is like active strategy includes like in person active strategy that is done at the health facility and also you can complement that using a remote active strategy uh, before coming to work like everyone uh, does an assessment and report and they then they come so you are you are doing a double double layer uh, protection and uh, uh, ensuring that healthcare workers doesn't have uh, the illness uh, before coming to the healthcare facility so what is the ministry of health and family welfare risk categorization for healthcare workers who have contact with positive cases 
So it has been categorized into the risk category has been categorized into a high risk exposure and a low risk exposure. The healthcare worker or other person uh, providing care to COVID-19 case or a lab worker ha handling respiratory specimens from a COVID-19 case without recommended PPE or with possible breach in PPE is a high risk exposure. Or else if the person has performed an aerosol generating procedure without appropriate PPE or like a healthcare worker without a face mask or face shield or goggle having face-to-face uh, -face contact with the COVID-19 patient within one meter for more than 15 minutes, then it is categorized as a high risk exposure. Low risk exposure is contact who do not meet the criteria of a high risk are called uh, low risk exposure. So, and there is a, a form for identifying this and this has to be reported to the uh, nodal officer of the healthcare facility who has been assigned as a coordinating authority for uh, uh, that particular health facility. So what is the guideline for healthcare worker who have contact with positive case? So all the high risk contact will be quarantined, tested as per ICMR testing protocol. They will be actively monitored for development of symptoms and managed as per the laydown protocol. If they test positive but remain asymptomatic, they will follow the protocol for very mild, mild or pre-symptomatic case. So again, like there is a criteria for clinical management of cases. So they, you can refer to those guidelines which are mentioned below. If they test positive and remain asymptomatic as per ICMR guideline, they complete 14 day quarantine. But again, please be informed. This may vary from state to state, like your state, may, like Tamil Nadu may be following a different guideline. So please get uh, the latest guidance from your health facility, uh, from the state government authorities. And uh, like the state, the state government quarantine guidelines will be followed for this. And low risk contact shall continue to work and they will self monitor their health for development of symptoms. So that's all I would like to mention about uh, the um, um, prevention strategies and some surveillance methods in uh, for the healthcare uh, provider um, uh, safety. And uh, here are some of the forms like which we sharing with you. So these are self-monitoring forms for asymptomatic healthcare worker. And this is for active monitoring. You can uh, utilize this form. These are originally from your centers for disease control, which can be adapted and used. If at all some exposure happens, there is a risk assessment uh, for the exposed workers. So this can be readily used. This is very, this will be very helpful if there is an outbreak or if there is COVID in your healthcare facility, if you want to identify like where the exposure has happened, you can use this standard forms which are available uh, for uh, uh, your using. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, now over to Dr. Dan for for the discussion of the questions raised uh, during the registration. Thanks, Dr. Bong. Uh, yes, and Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for the very clear, concise presentation. Uh, now I shall be putting forward the questions which were yes. which you got uh, in the registration form. Is my screen visible? Yes. Excellent. So the first question was, are the current measures sufficient to control the spread among health workers? So the, the current measures that are being advocated, you know, mask wearing, social distancing, uh, you know, if they're done correctly, can and should protect healthcare workers. The issues come into, uh, are they being done correctly? Are, does everyone wear their mask as prescribed? 
is there a current uh, ventilation uh, to limit any chance of in, an aerosolized uh, virus in the air? Is that being carried out? Are people washing their hands to limit any potential fomite or contact transmission? If it's all done correctly, the current measures should protect healthcare workers. You know, are they taking off their PPE appropriately so they don't self-contaminate? Based on the evidence that we have, if a healthcare facility and a healthcare worker applies all recommended measures, then the risk is sufficient. The, the risk is low. Over. So thank you. So the next question is, do people who get exposed to the virus, frequently like healthcare professionals, develop some kind of resistance or immunity to the virus? So immunity to the virus is something that has not yet been completely understood. We know that uh, individuals who are uh, diagnosed with COVID do develop antibodies. How long those antibodies remain is average around two weeks, but we don't really know what the protection is for healthcare providers who have gotten the virus. If we look at coronaviruses and we look at the common cold coronaviruses, we know that individuals can be reinfected with the same coronavirus, like the common cold. We also know that SARS and MERS, which are also coronaviruses, have been shown in prior studies to have limited immunity one to two years. You know, a, a few days ago, the, the CDC updated one of their web pages and uh, on there, they have not documented anyone that's been reinfected with a SARS-CoV-2 virus. That does not mean that it's not possible or not happening. It's just that to date, we're, we haven't been able to find documented evidence that a healthcare worker or an individual who acquired in the community has, um, when re-exposed, developed a subsequent infection. Although it's something that is an, an unanswered question that definitely needs more work. To the next question. Are there work restrictions recommended for HCP with underlying health conditions who may care for COVID-19 patients? So individual facilities, states, or governments may choose to engage work restrictions for healthcare providers who are older, who have comorbidities, or are immunocompromised because these are the patients that have a higher risk for death. So, I know that there are uh, healthcare facilities who have reassigned healthcare workers based on risk to lower risk situations to avoid the potential of them contracting uh, SARS-CoV-2 and getting coronavirus and then dying. Uh, but a lot of these work restrictions are facility dependent, state dependent, but based on the evidence, um, they are at increased risk if they have underlying health conditions. The next question is, what are the instructions or precautions for the safety of pregnant healthcare provider who is treating COVID patients? So at this point from the literature, we know that pregnant uh, individuals may be an increased risk for severe illness from COVID-19 compared to non-pregnant. And there may be an increased risk of adverse outcomes such as preterm birth. Again, a lot of this evidence is being uh, evolved. I've also seen a study where even though the pregnant individuals may be an increased risk for severe illness, there was an increased risk for death. So, you know, this is again where facilities and states and governments may have their own rules and regulations for healthcare providers who are taking care of COVID patients. But just to know the evidence to date is that if someone is pregnant and contracts COVID, they uh, may be at an increase for more severe illness. Okay, sir. 
what is the type of PPE to be worn by an healthcare provider during transporting COVID patients or suspected COVID patients? So, um, again, there may be something that's India specific guidance from Ministry of Health and Family Welfare and Bolin. I don't know if you know of any specific guidance on this. Um, but in general, any PPE is designed to, to protect the healthcare worker and also the patient. So someone who's transporting someone with COVID needs to have a mask, usually a, a face covering or some kind of goggles if they're going to be close to that patient, if there's a risk for um, them coughing on that healthcare worker and then gowns and, and gloves. And also the route that is taken by the COVID patient needs to be mapped out to avoid unnecessary exposure of that COVID patient to non-COVID patients. So this is where COVID wards that have dedicated routes to uh, surgical suites or radiology suites that avoid non-COVID wards or non-COVID patients is something that healthcare facilities should look at. So what are the precautions to be followed while disposing dead bodies of COVID infected patients? Bolin, do you wanna take this one? Uh, sure, Dan. So uh, the, the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare uh, from EMR and NCDC has, uh, divisions has given uh, clear guidelines on dead body management. Okay. Like this is different from WHO, you know, like WHO doesn't recommend any additional precaution. Like only thing is, uh, they, what they mention is do not embalm the body and uh, uh, like, um, and you have to ensure that there is no leaking don't touch or hug the body or kiss the body unnecessarily. So Indian guidelines uh, mention that like you have to, once the patient dies, uh, like uh, due to COVID, like and you have the established diagnosis, so keep the body inside, inside a bag that is a leak proof bag and uh, it has to be closed and the outside of the body should be disinfected uh, with 1% hypochlorite. So uh, before uh, keeping the closing the body inside the bag, like you have to ensure that there is nothing leaking. For example, if you are removing a catheter or if you are removing a uh, central vein cannula or like something like that, so you have to ensure that uh, like no body fluid or blood or something is leaking. So that has to be you can keep the gauze and stop uh, like stop it wearing appropriate uh, personal protective equipment and close the body and disinfect with hypochlor one percent hypochlorite and transport the body uh, and uh, what Indian guidelines recommend is even the ambulance, which is uh, a mortuary van, which is uh, transporting the body has to be disinfected with the person hypochlorite and you can dispose of the body. So again, like uh, while disposing, you have to follow the uh, religious customs. Like if, if their religious practice is to cremate the body, it can be cremated or you can go for a deep burial like us, uh, uh, as per the what their religious faith uh, demands, you know. So, but all times you have to ensure, like, not only uh, caring for the uh, ill pe people, but also have to be respectful with the dead, like the dead person also. Like he was, uh, he was a like respectable person, like before, death, and that has to be continued. And you have to respect of the uh, uh, the people who were dead to COVID and appropriate uh, respect has to be given like while transportation or during the burial. So uh, hope this uh, answers your question. Uh, do you want to take this question, sir? It asks do's and don'ts of healthcare workers. I think this has been extensively discussed. Yeah, earlier. yes. So you can move to the I next. can skip. Yes, yeah. And uh, what are some of the high risk and relatively low risk medical procedures also being? Risk, yeah, we have discussed. Okay, so, uh, so okay. this question says if PP runs out, what are some of the best ways with which you can prevent exposure? So, Dan, like, do you want me to show the PP slides? Sure. Okay. So, you can just uh, stop sharing. Uh, Doctor. Yes, sir. Yeah. 
disturbance. See my slides? Yes, sir. Okay. So, Dan, you can take over. So, this we have discussed. And we start from here. So, uh, PPE, if you're running out of PPE, uh, you know, one is calculating, when am I going to run out of PPE? And both CDC and WHO have forecasting tools. So your healthcare facility should have a system in place where they're forecasting if they have enough PPE. And these are two different tools. I think uh, initially it's the WHO tool might be where we would start to calculate it, but this is something your facility should be doing. Next. One way that you can minimize PPE is to engage staff in using telemedicine. Uh, you can use physical barriers, such as glass or plastic, between the patient, your general staff, people that are checking in, but also healthcare workers, so that you don't have to give them PPE. Uh, also, if you cohort staff not involved in direct patient care from COVID patients is a way that you can maximize the use of PPE. Now, I would say that this is very contingent on a screening program of healthcare providers and patients for symptoms of COVID. As Volan was explaining in his slides, and what we've seen in several case studies is that healthcare workers who work in areas that are deemed to be not COVID wards may have a higher risk if they're not hand washing their hands, doing appropriate uh, PPE use because they have this false sense of security that they're okay. And there was a nice study in Durban, South Africa that was published that clearly showed that healthcare workers who felt like they were not dealing with COVID patients actually facilitated the transfer and also patients were able to give it to healthcare workers in those wards. Next slide. If you do not have PPE, consider reuse of PPE. And when you reuse of PPE, you should have uh, things like goggles and face shields. Now this is outside of general recommendations and not recommended if there's an adequate supply of PPE. If you're reprocessing equipment, you need dedicated staff to oversee PPE to make sure that you're not putting PPE out that hasn't been cleaned appropriately or could pose a risk because it has holes, it's ripped, or it's not uh, appropriate. Next. So N95s is the uh, PPE that most commonly were questioned about, the can we reuse it? And if we look at the SARS-CoV-2, it has, uh, needs a host to survive. It can survive on surfaces and, you know, uh, N95s are made out of plastic, steel, cardboard. And if you put those together, 72 hours is really the limit. So, um, there are different ways to reprocess PPE, but in our experience in talking with sites, both in India and in different parts of the world, reuse with uh, a uh, time between use. So you're using a uh, respirator and then 95 and letting it set for five days and then reusing it. In that time period, the SARS-CoV-2 is dying and that keeps you safe. Over. Our next slide. Yeah. Next slide. So, uh, yeah, and also Dan, like you can mention about like what all are the some strategies about disinfect yeah. and so, when not to eat. Sure. Uh, let's see. 
So there are different ways, different strategies that have been um, used and all of them have limited research. Some of which are not recommended, some of which are more promising and we'll go through these uh, quickly. Next slide. So we've kind of touched on periodic reuse based on the surface. Uh, there is uh, limited evidence on how much SARS-CoV-2 comes in the mask. So a small study in Singapore that didn't find a lot of um, SARS-CoV-2 on PPE. This room was appropriately ventilated at 12 extra exchanges per hour in situations where you're using aerosolized generating procedures that may be a higher rate. And in, when you're doing an aerosolized generating procedures, generally you are not supposed to reuse that N95 mask, but should immediately get a new one. Other ways that contamination could be uh, sterilized is heat treatment. Uh, the SARS-CoV-2 can't survive at high temperatures, so 65 degrees for 30 minutes. So there's a protocol uh, here on this that uh, allows you to safely reuse the mask, although it does potentially damage the mask and you can't keep doing this forever. Uh, next slide. Also, there's been use of steam sterilization. There again, you're looking at the filtration efficacy. These masks have uh, these electrostatic charges that are degraded by some of these treatment methods and have limited evidence. Next. If you're looking at uh, soaking it in alcohol or chlorine, these definitely are not recommended. You can see from this Stanford study that you have a really marked decrease in the filtration efficacy. And you're looking at uh, N95s that function more as a good surgical mask rather than an N95 because of the decreased filtration efficacy. Next slide. And then chlorine, of course, it, you know, is very irritating to the lungs. And so that's also not good for healthcare workers. Ethylene oxide uh, is definitely not recommended. It can be teratogenic, carcinogenic. And so this was uh, used by some facilities really early, but since uh, should be abandoned. Hydrogen peroxide um, has um, some promise. Um, and uh, again, limited evidence, we get into how often they can be used. Um, and next slide. You know, at the bottom of this is a very nice website where all the evidence is summarized. Uh, again, moist heat. Uh, UV light. So here, UV light, this is a protocol out of Nebraska, and there are different protocols. And this particular website here at the bottom, you can find the protocol on how to do this. Uh, again, each individual UV light has its own strength, distance from the mass that you need to do it. So you may not be able to do a one-to-one -one, uh, use of this particular protocol. And again, the evidence is limited, but if you have it and you can potentially use it and that's all you have, at least you have some guidance and a place you can look. Yeah, thank you, Dan. So then we can go to the next question, Dr. Apurva. You can share your screen. So the next question goes as are empiric antibiotics recommended for healthcare workers suspected of having COVID-19? So at this point, WHO and CDC have no recommendations for empiric use of antibiotics or other antimicrobials for healthcare workers. You know, this may differ from states or other countries, but that's, I'm just giving you WHO and CDC recommendations based on current evidence. Okay, sir. So the next question is, how long does an examination room need to be vacant 
after being occupied by a patient with confirmed or suspected COVID-19? So a patient with confirmed or suspected COVID-19 should be wearing a mask in a healthcare facility and so should the provider. We know that studies from Nebraska and Singapore, when they've sampled the environment of, uh, uh, of rooms that have COVID-19 patients, they become heavily contaminated with coronavirus. But we also know that a room, when it's cleaned with an appropriate disinfectant, uh, is this easily kills the virus. So I would say one, it needs to be cleaned after the patient enters the room and has suspected COVID uh, if they are in there for a, a period of time. And you're also looking at the ventilation. You're looking for ventilation between six and 12 air exchanges per hour. And if you're not sure what that could mean, uh, if you're looking at a room that has an open window and open door, and the room is a fair size, your air exchange rate is around 42. So picking a room as an examination room that's well ventilated or a negative pressure uh, is also important. Um, how long that room needs to be vacant is dependent on the ventilation in that room. Okay, so the next question is how do you see increasing cases of COVID amongst healthcare workers? How do you document it? So if you're going to look at documenting increasing cases, you would have to have some surveillance system. And this is what Bullen had described in his presentation. You need a systematic way where you're constantly assessing and monitoring your healthcare workers. When we look at studies from um, New England, the public health England, the US, you know, this varies between three and 10% from the studies I've seen, but it could also be in your facility if you have lots of coronavirus higher than that. It really is gonna be dependent on cases in the community and also how well a particular facility is engaging in PPE and also how well they're able to screen and identify those workers. So this is kind of a, a difficult question. You need a lot of information to answer this question. Yeah, yeah so uh, unless uh, to complement then like uh, you have to have a strong surveillance system like um, either it can be passive or active but uh, surveillance and documentation and analyzing of the report is very, very important not only at the facility level but at the district state and the national level to understand have a better understanding about uh, like whether it is increasing or decreasing and why it is increasing to know the causes next um, so this question i think we have how acute or acute to doctors and paramedical staff with protection they mean like in the state region and region wise there yeah, that's what the question is uh pointed at do you want me to speak sir yeah you can uh, go okay. to the uh, so next question goes as which field amongst doctors are most vulnerable to COVID according to you? Which field uh, in the sense? Uh, uh, which which speciality? Speciality. Yeah. Okay. So I think that, you know, this gets into um, fields that deal a lot with patients. So pulmonologists that are working with doing a lot of intubations and aerosolized generating procedures or emergency room doctors that are seeing a lot of patients come through or ear, nose and throat surgeons or dentists. All those are uh, fields where they're very close to an airway. And because many patients are asymptomatic and we have many cases of documented asymptomatic transmission, those providers are at higher risk because they're closer. But I would also say that uh, fields where doctors do not take appropriate precautions are also at risk. And we do have many cases where doctors who are taking care of patients in the community who are not really taking standard precautions and wearing their appropriate PPE are likely to get infected because they don't 
take the risk seriously. They don't take infection prevention control seriously. And so sometimes what we also see is that those that are working in high risk situations with COVID patients in intensive care units are actually safer because there's a higher awareness of what PPE they should be using and a higher adherence to that PPE as opposed to where they feel that there's less risk. So I would just say for you as, as doctors, you should take all standard precautions and wear a PPE appropriately for all patients at all times, not also for them, but also for you, because we have many cases where doctors are transmitting COVID to their patients and doctors can be asymptomatic and transmit to their patients just as much as patients can be asymptomatic and transfer it to you. Okay. It is rising cases in healthcare manpower and equity of it is a concern. I mean, I mean in, in a pandemic situation, in a pandemic situation, when you have rising cases and it overwhelms a healthcare system and you have few staff to take care of those patients, I would agree that this is a concern in any country, in any situation. And in those situations, I think it's also a concern on what kind of care we can provide to patients. And whether it's a high resource setting, low resource setting, when you are overwhelmed with patients and you are just trying to get through the day and trying to provide care to everyone, sometimes, and there's an acknowledgement in public health and in the medical profession that you sometimes have to um, do the best you can. Um, and this is also where I think that we need to prepare our systems for these type of situations, regardless of situation, so that we have enough healthcare, we have enough manpower to deal with these kind of conditions, not only just in India, but around the world. Over. Yes, sir. Uh, the next question is kind of in line with this. So uh, it's specific to India, India. So do you think students need to be roped in for additional support in your considered opinion? I'm not ex sure what additional support is. Can you explain that to me? Uh, in the sense, uh, they in the sense like final year medical students or medical students in general uh, in, in the the setting of lack of staff yeah, to yeah, care yeah, for sure. patients, should they be, should, do you think it's a good option for them to rope in students? So this is again, a, a facility or a state or a government's decision on how they allocate their students. Uh, I know that there are students who graduated early so that they could put them into uh, places where they could be used. I know that even in, in countries like England, where they were overwhelmed, they were asking tech staff who are not physicians and not medical students to man ventilators. They were training them how to use ventilators and asking them to man ventilators because they just didn't have enough people. So not only students are being asked to provide care, it is non-traditional uh, medical providers that are being asked to do much more than their training um, in order to provide care for the vast numbers of people that are presenting. Okay, so. uh, I think this, this question also can be skipped. Yeah. Uh, due to time, time constraint, uh, I think it's better to skip similar questions Okay, yeah, you can move on. Total, there were 30 questions. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Uh, so in this question, it says, what is your opinion on administering healthcare workers with flu vaccines? Will it be effective? So flu vaccines are effective against flu. And we haven't really entered flu season to know how flu administration is going to affect COVID. There has been many uh, documents uh, that have shown that SARS-CoV-2 virus can coexist with flu. It can coexist with other viruses. So the, 
there's also a concern that, you know, in, in a population, not only healthcare providers, that when flu season comes, it could be very uh, problematic if someone has flu and coronavirus. Um, so I think that the recommendation is, is still that healthcare workers should be getting flu vaccines, but I don't know, uh, you know, what the effect will be on SARS-CoV-2 because those studies haven't been done because it's, it's, uh, it's still early. Thanks, Bill. So the next question is Covaxin, a COVID vaccine is currently under trial in India and will be out in the market within a year. Can it be assumed to be safe enough when most other vaccines take a minimum of 10 years of safety trial? Yeah, I mean, vaccines are being um, developed and are in trial at a much faster pace than we've had in other situations. And all vaccines have risks and benefits and much is unknown. So a lot of vaccine work is, is, is underway. If a particular vaccine is safe or not, that's why you have to have trials to understand if it's safe or if it is not safe. And you can only do that by just having some trials and if it's unsafe to stop and pursue a different direction. And if it does appear safe, then you end up with larger populations being exposed. And again, that safety profile being assessed. Um, but because of the concern and the, the potential high, um, high impact of a, virus, uh, a viral vaccine for coronavirus, um, you know, this again is something that we want to do, but we also want to be safe. And uh, we just have to look at the data when it comes in. Okay. Um, since COVID has been declared airborne, does this put healthcare workers at a higher risk of intra-hospital infections? Do you want uh, to comment on uh, COVID being declared airborne or not? Do you want to clarify that? Yeah, too? I'll talk a little bit about it. You know, the, the issue with coronavirus is airborne versus non-airborne. And I think it's, it's a matter of what the degree is. You know, there was a JAM article that came out relatively recently, and I can share that with you to share with them. That kind of summarizes it. And, you know, what we're seeing is that in the laboratory setting, you can make the virus airborne and you can detect it in the air. In the real world, there are some cases where it seems like there is some element of it being airborne, but it is not felt to be a primary means of transmission. It can contribute to transmission, but if we look at some airborne virus like measles, which is truly airborne, the R0 for measles is between 13 and 18. And if somebody with measles walks into a room, a closed room and makes it airborne, that virus will stay in the air for 30 minutes. And anyone walking into that room is, has a high probability of getting that virus. We are not seeing that same situation in the epidemiology for coronavirus. Although we have this restaurant in, in um, China where you have the air conditioner kind of recirculating the air, although we have uh, a, an incident in Washington where you have a choir practice that went two and a half hours. What we're seeing is that the epidemiology is not having an R naught of 13 to 18. It's more like 2.5. And also in those situations, we're looking at the duration of time. In the case in China, that duration of time was 50 to 70 some minutes. In the case of the the choir, it was two and a half hours, and they were also in close proximity in settings where they were sharing tea and, and cookies. So you can't put it all on airborne. So I would say that that evidence is still very much evolving. It's possible that it's contributing, but it's not something that if you wear a mask, if you're working in ventilated conditions, those seem to be very protective for healthcare workers. Uh, and it's, 
it's something that we'll get more evidence on. But I would say for you, if you're concerned about it, always wear a mask. An N95 if you're working in close proximity with patients and work in uh, well-ventilated areas. And also, you know, wear a face shield if, if you're um, working in close proximity as well as per the recommendations. Excellent. Okay, the next question is, what advice would you give to families with healthcare, healthcare workers caring for COVID? The family members of the healthcare workers. Yes. So families of healthcare workers, the healthcare worker has a responsibility to take care of him or herself and wear the appropriate PPE. And then when they're coming home, be very cautious. We know that healthcare workers are at higher risk because they're seeing patients with coronavirus. But we also know that in families and when the community, many healthcare workers are bringing into the hospital. So in a study that was in England, you know, 40, 40 to close to 50% of the healthcare workers were not getting in the hospital, they were getting it from their own family units and friends and family. So uh, I think that here, it's everyone needs to be aware. You need to do some self-monitoring. This is what Bullen had presented. Are you having symptoms? Are your family having symptoms? If anyone's having symptoms that you're aggressive in getting testing, getting treatment, so that you are not exposing either your family or your coworkers or patients that you take care of. I don't know, Bolin, you have anything you want to add to that? But uh... yeah, and and also, you know, like um, when you come home, you have to you can uh, wash your uh, clothes and you, um, separately in uh, hot water with usual detergent. Like separately, you can wash your clothes you are wearing for the um, um, uh, facility when you are visiting. And uh, also, you know, uh, like, uh, don't take like too many things, take your lunch or something and in a disposable uh, packet or like in a package thing and uh, just dispose it off. And like unnecessarily, like don't bring, bring uh, to the facility and back from there, uh, uh, like unnecessary, uh, bag bags or like any baggages and all and all, mainly the mobile phones uh, which you are using like there is a very beautiful guideline which were given from the new zealand uh, like um, health department which we will be able to share like we have some frequently asked questions we have included this as part uh, like we'll be able to share that you know like um, uh, this will be very very helpful you know like my very minor things but this will go a long way in protecting the families of the healthcare providers Sure. This again we have discussed uh, regarding yeah. yes. uh, So the next question is there has been an overcrowding of COVID hospitals especially in major cities like Chennai. Do you think this would place healthcare workers at a higher risk of infection or are there any additional ways in which they can protect themselves from infection? Again this has been discussed. Yeah discussed yeah triage. Uh, so the next question is, there has been a recent wake of patients with other complaints being tested positive for COVID-19, even though they initially tested negative for infection. Could this be a reason that COVID testing among doctors are inadequate and could be potential carriers of infection to their patients? So I think that if you stop sharing, I'll, I'll share my slides. Okay. I'll share some slides. because I think that this is kind of an area where I think that we need to have some clarity. So when we're talking about um, transmission. Most of the transmission that's happening is in the first period when somebody becomes symptomatic. There's cases of pre-symptomatic and then somebody develops symptoms. In the first five to six days, 
after someone has symptoms is when most of the transmission happens. It's also when most of the virus is being shed from the upper airway. And there was just a Taiwanese study that was published a few days ago that did not find um, cases in healthcare providers or contacts that happened six days after symptoms. And if we look at the difference between being able to detect the virus and the virus actually being a viable virus. So uh, this is documentation of asymptomatic transmission. We've kind of talked about that. So this particular study, which was, you know, this is a nice site here at the bottom of the slide on CDC. But let's answer the question, how long does a person remain infectious and shed live virus after they become infected? And the answer is between seven and 10 days. The, the evidence that we have so far is seven to 10 days. So that means for most individuals who get SARS-CoV-2, it affects them and they have coronavirus, seven to 10 days after they have symptoms is when the virus can no longer be isolated as a live virus. But you can continue to detect the virus up to six weeks out, the average being around two weeks. So in individuals who continue to test positive using RT-PCR, so the, the test that's most often being used is RT-PCR. So they're continuing to test positive. But again, this is a different, because just because I can detect the virus does not mean that it's causing or can cause an infection. I need live virus to do that. And in that case, going back to this earlier slide, that is typically seven to 10 days. Now, I will say that there's a caveat to this. And the caveat is that in severe infections, in patients who have very severe infections, they're able to find the live virus sometimes up to 20 days after. So this does not apply to everybody. And this is where evidence is still needed. So in cases where you have a severe infection, that patient may actually shed live virus much longer than the seven to day period, which is for most individuals. So I think you have to look at the kind of infection, the severity of symptoms, and know that evidence is still evolving. But um, that's the answer to that, that I had to that question. Over. AIMS Delhi has recently deployed robots to avoid transmission from patients to healthcare workers. How effective in the long run do you think this measure might be? Yeah, I don't know much how the robots are actually being deployed, but I think the principle is that if there is uh, distance between healthcare providers and patients, that limits transmission. It also limits the patient's ability to transmit it to the healthcare worker. And, you know, we don't know how long coronavirus is going to be around. It could be that it's, you know, a season and then it kind of goes away. It could be with us for a long, long time. So how effective in the long run, I think, I think it depends on how these robots are used in the particular situations. But the principle is limiting that transmission. And if they can limit transmission from healthcare provider to patient, from patient to healthcare provider, it could be effective. Thank you. Yeah. Actually, they are using it for two purposes. Like one is mainly for disinfecting and also like uh, in the mainly in the uh, and for serving the patients. Uh, so mainly in the COVID wards. Okay, so uh, due to COVID, our supply chains have been compromised. As a result, even the PPEs have been made do not reach the required places. What is your take on this? Yeah, I don't have a take because, um, you know, I think this is a kind of a question for your hospital administrator or your state. 
on yeah. how they can can help with that. Yeah. So our advice would be please monitor the current stock of PPEs at all time. Like you can use the calculators for the burn rate and things like that, so that like you can ensure adequate st st stock is available in your health facility in your department. Like because like, that will be very helpful. You know, like if you are you using the burn rate calculators of uh, WHO will be very helpful to monitor your PP st like stock position. Okay. Uh, do you think treatment costs for COVID in private hospitals should be regulated by government, given it serves as a major concern for overcrowding in government COVID hospitals? Yeah, I can't comment on yeah. what a country can do for treatment or no treatment. I, I can say that there has been an effort by governments in other places around the world to make coronavirus testing and treatment affordable because if you limit uh, testing, especially, you end up with widespread or, or more widespread community transmission because people aren't coming to the hospital for testing. So if they don't know they have coronavirus because they are, don't have it available, then they feel that maybe they don't have it and they go and transmit it to others or they don't seek medical care. So there are arguments for making uh, coronavirus uh, treatment and testing affordable for uh, everyone from many different places around the room. Now, and the actual implementation of that has to be local and fit with uh, local government policies, guidelines, and, and feasibility. Even this question has been uh, addressed, so I will skip it. Uh, do you think a deficient contact tracing among healthcare workers has been one of the causes of increased infections among them? So I'll give you the, the case study that was from South Africa. In that particular case, there was a woman who came to the emergency room from a foreign country to South Africa and she tested positive. And in the emergency room, she um, was seen by a healthcare provider that then went over and saw a patient from a nursing home. That patient in the nursing home was also very close to the triage area. Now the woman who was tested positive, she went home, but the woman from the nursing home got coronavirus and then entered the hospital that patient eventually caused an outbreak in five wards in two outpatients, the dialysis unit and back at the nursing home, widespread transmission. And in that, there was no healthcare screening for healthcare workers for coronavirus that was routine. And because it wasn't routine and because the healthcare worker wasn't tested and found to be positive, there was transmission but it also was for healthcare for the patients too. So this is why surveillance of healthcare workers and patients is, a, is very important to limit transmission. That's just one example, but there are many, many other cases that I've heard. Okay, so we have come to the end of the session. This is the final question. We have seen an increasing trend of violence against frontline doctors uh, recently from the general public, and this is attributed to having a direct impact on their mental health, which in turn affects their job efficacy. How do you think we can deal with this? So the mental health of healthcare workers is extremely important. You, know, you as medical providers do a difficult job day in and day out. You work long hours. You take risks with your own health you also are risking bringing it back to your friends and family and loved ones. And you know, if you are also uh, exposed to any kind of attacks from the general public or others, it definitely can have a negative effect. And so working with your administrator to make this known, I think that you can't hold this in. I think you have to make it known to people that can message this as a concern within your own facility and up in your government because 
they are the ones that ultimately can um, put public health messaging out wherever you're at, in whatever country you're at. I think that also taking advantage of mental health counseling. I know that many facilities have uh, mental health counseling that's available and don't be afraid to, to reach out for help in that as well. Valenny, do you want to add anything or? Uh, yeah, and also there are uh, recent guidelines from Nimhans ba Bangalore uh, regarding supporting the counselings and things like that and counselling numbers are available for healthcare workers because like this is extremely stressful situation as Dr. Dan has mentioned. Uh, so you can use those, like there are videos uh, available uh, from Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. You can, the, you can utilize those uh, and like, I, I don't know, like, um, uh, like even in Tamil Nadu, they have every, every district, they have a mental health program. And now they are offering support to the healthcare professionals. Like, so I know like one of my colleagues in all the district. So, uh, so you, you can utilize all these opportunities. Yeah, I do agree. It is a very, very stressful uh, situation and uh, like really mental health uh, is an important thing which has to be taken care of. Yes, sir. That was the last question and uh, everything almost has been extensively, very extensively covered. Uh, so um, for those who, who are watching, guys, we have come to the end of the session. So if you have any questions, please put it in the put up put it up in the live chat. We shall wait for a few couple of minutes, and if we uh, don't have any questions, then we can end the session. People watching, put up your questions in the live chat in the comment box. So uh, people want. Uh, you to share the PPT, your presentation uh, later, if that is possible. Sure, like we will be sharing the presentation and additional materials uh, for the, from Dr. Dan and the, the case studies, what uh, Dr. Dan was uh, mentioning. So all those things we shared along with the uh, surveillance forms and things like that. Okay, sir. So. Dr. Dan will be sharing to you. You can share with the participants because you should be having their registration IDs uh, from yes, the sir. conference. Okay. Yes, These all uh, things are in public domain, so like you can use it. Okay. Uh, we don't have any questions. Uh, so we so can we conclude the session, sir? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for accepting our invite and making time and putting in the effort to come and present to us. And that was, was so extensive. You had almost covered every possible aspect of uh, the topic. Uh, it was very useful. And uh, and I also take a moment to thank our sponsors, Iris PG, an online PG preparation platform and Apipola, a mobile accessories and electronics company. Yes, sir. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sir.